as uh, we have reviewed uh, some of the chapters of the book. But right now we're gonna try to do a little bit a different way. So what we're gonna do, we will have to answer two more general questions that are connected. Actually, not two, but four uh, questions that are uh, more general questions, but uh, exciting questions that are connected with uh, the, the use of translanguaging uh, in learning and teaching. So uh, the uh, first part, what we're gonna do is. Uh, Han, uh, split you into four different kinds of groups and uh, uh, you're going to have uh, six, seven minutes to discuss uh, the given question and then you come back and uh, uh, report to us about your discussion and then we will have a general discussion on that. So this will be uh, the first thing that we're going to do. After that, uh, Jin Kong uh, will make a presentation and uh, we have a break. And after the break, we will have two presentations. Uh, one of them is Uzo's presentation. So we start with Uzo's presentation after the break. And at the end of the class, uh, we will listen to uh, Nyok Tong's uh, uh, interview presentation. So this is the plan. So uh, Han, please uh, take over and split the class into four different kinds of groups and uh, give uh, the four questions to everybody. Right, so I will just send all the questions to the chat box so that everyone can, you know, have access and know the questions of all groups. So please wait for me a little bit. Okay. All right, so everyone, please um, download the file to your computers. If any group mate um, in the in, in, um, team member cannot see it, please kindly share um, the screen to them so that they can see the questions. Um, let me also put it in the chat just in case so that everyone see it uh, in case they couldn't download the file. Oh, it seems like Zoom Zoom doesn't let me copy and paste. Um, but do you have any uh, difficulty download the file? Okay, I was able to get the file. Thanks, Andy. So, um, then the next thing is, uh, I will put you in a group. Uh, it's a random group, and so if you are in group one, it means you will address question one. Group two, room number two, we will set, uh, will address question number two. All right. And then there can be three to four people in your group and this is totally random. Um, so yeah, please um, bear with me for a few minutes when I put you in different group. You're gonna have seven minutes all together to kind of discuss the given question. Uh, the... Seven minutes, you mean professor? Yes, seven minutes, yes. Okay, seven minutes, so let's say we'll be but, okay, let me put uh, the room at first. 45. Yes, 45 is okay if they come back at 45. Okay. All right, so seven minutes, let's say we'll be back at 4.47. 40, uh, roughly around that, I will let you know uh, one or two minutes before the time is up. All right, so see everyone within seven minutes. Let me see the, the room. Okay, so who are in the room? Okay, which room? Andy Beverly, okay. What, what is a Nyoptung? Nyoptung, did, did he join after all? Yes, Professor, he is room number two for question number two. 
Okay, and how about uh, room four? Uh, yeah, please. room four is Wang Wang, Ying Kong, and Ying Ru. Okay. Isabel is in room number two. Yeah, I see. I see. The, I don't see number four, but I see all the others around number one, number oh. two. Okay. So, good. All right. So, you are in, in New York, yes, right now? Yeah. I told you earlier, I didn't see a native speaker until the age of 25, you know? And I had no uh, way to kind of uh, emerge in the uh, British culture or American culture or whatever. And I, I'm not the only one. So, you know, it, it, we have to think about the fact that how do we handle this one unitary system if there is an individual who sits in his armchair and he decides to learn uh, Persian language or uh, Vietnamese or, or, or Russian or whatever, you know? So that, that's a, a, an issue. So what happens to this unitary system if the individual decides to focus only one of the, his languages? Because, you know, for example, there is a guy who is a, a, a speaker of uh, uh, German and French. So his first language is German, second language is French. And uh, he says that, all right, you know, uh, uh, what I'm doing, uh, I'm gonna uh, 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 learn uh, Czech. I, I, I wanna learn Czech. That's so. What happens here? Czech will be a part of this one unitary system, or or what? So when I study Czech, I study Czech. I do not study German, French, or whatever. I focus on that particular language system if I want to acquire it, you know. And I can do that in my armchair, looking into a textbook and doing the exercises, or uh, go to the website and do that. So. This is where you know we have a problem, do not we? So what do you think about it? Because that is an individual side of the matter. So you know there there are certain facts uh, that uh, do not let us make this kind of uh, one unitary system idea develop uh, uh, further. You know because uh, the the dynamism and flexibility of of language use and language learning and the, the individual uh, uh, person, you know, uh, actually participate in this whole thing, you know? So we have to be very careful what we say. And uh, the, the other very important thing that you mentioned, Beverly, in the summary of your discussion was the, the different registers, the different registers. Because you know we have different registers, so if you are a bilingual or a trilingual, okay, then of course you have different registers in these three different languages. So uh, the registers are not the same. If I'm a doctor, for example, of course uh, I'm familiar with the medical uh, language, and of course, uh, again, going... professor, you are a doctor. I know. I'm thinking about a medical doctor. You know. But that's important. That's an important distinction because there are lots of different doctors and the languages and registers that they use are all different. It's yeah. like access to a very specific uh, set of senses for pre-existing labels. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is that uh, we have to take into consideration a lot of different factors and different sides of, of language knowledge when we talk about separation of languages, you know? So there are a lot of arguments for separating the languages and not handling them as one unitary system. Of course, uh, again, we said that language use is flexible. And I think that Bef Beverly mentioned briefly that there are cases, of course, when we, we handle our knowledge as one unitary system. And there are other cases where we handle uh, our system as separate. You know, so after all, I, I, that that's how we should understand this translanguaging. This flexibility and dynamism is there all the time. So we cannot say that uh, the, we always rely on this one unitary linguistic system because occasionally we have to kind of open up a, a part of that one unitary system as a separate system, you know? And then we, we, maybe we cannot rely on or do not necessarily want to rely on the, the other part, you know? So these questions are all connected with how we handle 
translanguaging. And I think that the decision of the group was good because we still can talk about translanguaging even if we make a separation, you know? So that is much more dynamic than they uh, uh, kind of describe. They always refer to dynamism, flexibility, okay. But, but, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily very happy with how they kind of uh, interpret this whole thing, you know, in connection with the one unitary linguistic repertoire. Okay, any additional ideas or uh, issues that you have here? I think um, in the book, they also cited the, uh, the findings from psycholinguistics, which argue that there is a unitary linguistics uh, repertoire like in the mind, the languages are not separated. But that is in, in the conceptual level. Um, and I think that they don't make the distinction between conceptual and you know linguistics. So even they take in, into consideration the psycholinguistics findings, the way that they interpret um, those findings, I think is, is a little bit misunderstanding. Um, yeah, I think I just want to add that. Thank you. All right, let's go to the second group then. The second the question is, do you think that one methodology developed for translanguaging will work or we must develop multiple methodologies to meet different challenges? Or given the nature of translanguaging, we must relay, rely on an ad hoc uh, developed approach in each teaching situation. This is a very interesting question because we had the presentation of Isabel for the last two weeks. So what do you think? We have Onhi, Isabel, and Tung um, in, in uh, room number two. What do you think? I can try to summarize what we discussed and then um, anyone from the group can feel free to just jump in. Uh, so I think we talked about the, the fact that there might be an overarching approach with really uh, general understandings of these um, theoretical positionings that they have been proposing, like what are the purposes of education um, and maybe their understanding of the theory of learning and theory of languages. And as far as these two are concerned, I don't think that they have done a good job explaining to us what's their understanding of a theory of learning or their theory of how we learn languages. Um, and then another consideration is that um, there might not be a unique methodology considering that we have to teach content and language. So I think that's something that Roberto mentioned several times that it might not actually um, be the same methodology, whether you're teaching languages or you're teaching content. And last, I think there's also something, and it's connected to what um, you were just discussing, um, Professor Site. Um, populations are very different. Um, also classroom settings are very different. What students know is very different. And uh, a unique methodology might not be possible at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if um, Yung Hee wants to add up to that. Um, I guess looking at this question up close now, <laughs> it's in three parts. Um, and then I don't think we discussed, we didn't have enough time to discuss the mm -hmm. third part. Or do we... Must we develop multiple methodologies given the nature of translanguaging? We must, all right, do we, must we rely on an ad hoc developed approach in each teaching situation, right? We didn't get to that yet. Mm -hmm. We were discussing like, okay, so by ad hoc, what do they mean? Do they mean on the spot approach? But then it's hard to say that's developed, you know, with like all these, you know, theories and, uh, with you know theories or developmental stages in mind um and that's and if it's ad hoc developed approach it's sort of hard to um, um uh, track that uh, also you need do you know what i meant maybe the the phrase is uh, ambiguous a little bit but what i meant uh, by that was that when you are in a classroom situation of course you have to kind of uh, uh, use different kind of methodology occasionally, and then you ad hoc develop something uh, to address on the, the spot. You on the spot that that emerges in right. the teaching. Yes, That's what I mean. right, 
Right. I think in the end, we said yes to all of these. Yes, there should be some overarching approach. Yeah. And then, yes, we must develop multiple methodologies to meet different challenges and different learning environment for different target, you know, for different learning groups of learners and stuff. Also, we need to sometimes, you know, rely on some ad hoc approach that is emergent because we don't know what can happen in the classroom. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that this is your conclusion that all the three methodologies are present. So it's very difficult to kind of uh, develop an overarching uh, methodology here, you know, because of the nature of the thing, you know. And uh, this might not necessarily be a good idea as we see uh, basically Garcia and, and, and uh, Li Wei have been struggling with this issue, you know, because the fact that they want to kind of uh, have this uh, one unitary uh, linguistic repertoire or whatever, you know, uh, forces them somehow to go that direction where they want to uh, develop a, an overarching methodology, which is impossible because of the nature of those language, you know. So we all have to rely on these kind of three different kind of methodological approaches, depending on, you know, in what situation we are. Okay. Anything else to add to this issue? Um, I think that this, um, this issue reminds me of what was mentioned in Garcia and Wei's book, chapter six, about what they call official translanguaging and natural translanguaging this idea that like natural and they, they give an example of when the teacher is trying to clarify something or as if he's he or she is talking to the student and it translanguages in a natural way as you would outside the classroom let's say and then uh, the official translanguaging is that the planned translanguaging is like pedagogical thought went into um, structuring an activity which promotes translanguaging and I thought it was like I it was difficult for me to think that these I mean, I understand that this the separation conceptually, but like in practice, it would be very difficult to like um, uh, separate one from the other, because I think that when you you plan something, probably when you're when you're executing it, you probably will 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 shift to something which wasn't planned. And then start clarifying something with this. So that would be like natural. So every time like you're monitoring your translanguaging, you're doing like you're it's more like planned translanguaging. But if you're not monitoring it, then it's more natural translanguaging. And because we shift I mean, as a teacher, right, we shift naturally from one um, mode to the other mode. I, I didn't really see like the um, the usefulness of this type of um, dichotomy like this conceptual dichotomy and i think that speaks to what we just talked about like having to rely on these three different um approaches to translanguaging as a pedagogy mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point yeah anything else you you want to add to this if not then uh, thank you and let's go to number three Yes, so I think because Roboto are starting to talking about, you know, different variables that can be problematic as well. So let's talk about one variable. So for example, what the student investment means in translanguaging, how is that connected with the student intake? Uh, investment was known to be an important element for, of learning before translanguaging. What new elements do you think translanguaging can add to our understanding of learner investment? Okay. Who are the people who worked on this question? Roboto. <laughs> you want Whoa. to make a connection? <laughs> so Roboto, Nicole, and Uzo. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, uh, I can start here. Well, um, First of all, we 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 um, talked about what investment was, right? Student investment, um, because we we had this um, trying to compare like to motivation or distinguish it from motivation. So then, leaving motivation aside, we were focusing more on investment as something which the student brings to the learning experience from themselves, um, from their identity and their um, cultural background, and so what they bring to um, the experience 
of learning. And then translanguaging um, sort of values that which the student is bringing, and then they can build on, on that. So that's how we uh, perceive investment, right? And, and the way that translanguaging can um, or connects to, to investment or can boost investment, especially because it values the children, uh, the, the, the students' um, first language and cultural knowledge and tries to leverage that. They use, a lot, they use that term a lot in the, in the book, like to leverage and to scaffold, right? So use translanguaging to um, build knowledge from the knowledge that the students already bring and thus valuing them, uh, their culture, uh, yeah, through, through the language, through their L1. Okay, that's a good point. Any other, Uso, what do you think? Okay. Well, um, I'm going to actually capture our thoughts, but just to add to what he said, we may mention that every student um, embodies um, a linguistic capital. That's the investment he comes into the classroom with. And when they have like um, a group activity, like talking about a particular con con uh, concept in the classroom, um, a teacher that encourages a culturally respect responsible uh, learning environment to allow them to share their knowledge across the groups so that the entire class becomes kind of multilingual. Everybody shares in the values each of these um, languages can bring to the learning environment with teacher facilitating the conversation. Okay, uh, Nicole, what do you think? I think my two peers did a great job summarizing that. But the only thing I think to add is um, in addition to bringing their identity and cultural background experiences to the table, also their skill set. So thinking about their literacies in L1 or other background knowledge that they know, um, they also bring those skills to the table. Yeah, definitely. So I'm glad that you mentioned at the very beginning that uh, there is a difference between investment and motivation. So these are two different things, you know, the uh, motivation uh, being more individual while investment is more like social, you know, because uh, you may not be motivated, but you still can invest into something, you know, so that is how we can understand this uh, uh, connection between the two after all. So occasionally it happens that, you know, people are not necessarily motivated to do something, but you know, uh, cool-headedly they invest into things, you know, because they think that uh, in the environment where they are, you know, they need to kind of make a step forward after all. So uh, uh, definitely it's an important thing for us to kind of make this difference and both these factors uh, actually have a great impact on uh, what individual students do uh, in classroom environments. Okay, the last question. Last question, how can translanguaging support literacy development? How does translanguaging change our understanding of biliteracy? Do you mean parallel development of literacy in two languages or develop of literacy in one language constantly supported by reliance on another language? Uh, we have Wang Guan, Ying Kong and Ying Ru. Okay, who is the summarizer? Um, I can just, uh, summarize and then my uh, partner maybe can add some, their opinion. Um, we think this is a complex question and then we cannot come to a unified conclusion. Um, as for uh, the parallel development of literacy in two languages, we think maybe it is hard to find such parallel development. Um, and also for translanguaging when it comes to support literacy development, I think it is more like cognitive development or for example, we learn the second language from the first language uh, by learning those concepts through the first language. In that aspect, translanguaging can help learners uh, cognitively develop um, those concepts uh, behind the, the two or multiple languages. And also, um, 
when it comes to like my literacy, uh, personally, I think it is like a one consistent literacy, but when it comes to literacy, it has to be reflected in different language channel, which means the learners have to uh, practice the specific verb with the phonetics and, and, their, and everything else. So some, to some extent, translanguaging maybe uh, need to uh, be in, integrated with other methodology, teaching methodologies to help st students practice their language production with that specific linguistic thing, uh, systems. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any anything else from this group? This question. I think that is for the translanguaging supporting literary development. Uh, we can say something uh, on the perspective of the functions of translanguaging, because as far as I know, there's one of the functions for translanguaging is to support uh, students, uh, uh, that is their understanding or co comprehension of uh, complex text and uh, uh, and uh, and also the the uh, uh, the text uh, the, the content, so uh, I think that is the way we can support uh, literacy or by literacy development. Uh, additionally, so there's another function that is to uh, support the learners' uh, identity or their uh, social cultural uh, development. I think that is also helpful for the supporting of biliteracy. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you teach students uh, writing. And of course, that's a very important component of literacy. So what do you think about this issue, biliteracy issue? This is a hard one. Um, I think it's really important, um, but it, I think it depends on the context and how it's being done. Um, I really support my families, my, my students' families in, in them developing their language literacy at home, their L1 literacy at home, because I can't teach kids how to read Gujarati and you know Spanish and Portuguese and because I, 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 I can't do that. Um, and I think that our focus in has to be on teaching them how to write and read in the language we know how to teach them in. Uh, yeah, support is, is essential, but then how do we give those supports? Like, where does that money come from? I'm lucky that I have a budget and a small enough population, which is actually still a rather large population. We have 10% of our student population in the elementary school is now. So, you know, it, it's, um, we have some money to support the families, but not much, not a lot. The libraries, the public libraries have some um, Spanish language books, but not a lot. I mean, but then that excludes other groups. And it yeah, always well, comes back to that. What is important for us here, as far as literacy is concerned, that translanguaging definitely can support uh, literacy development as uh, Ying Kong refer, uh, referred to that. But at the end of the day, uh, when we teach writing or reading, you know, we focus on one language at a time somehow, you know. So when students write, you know, it would not be a good idea to kind of accept uh, a, something, you know, that is written in two languages at a time. Although uh, I can imagine some exercises or uh, scaffolding kind of tasks where you allow, even if you uh, teach reading, you allow uh, the, uh, the, the support of the first language or another language that the student may know. So after I, I, all- I, Yeah, can I add to this too? Because I, I think it's important that um, students who do come to the United States who have a strong background of literacy in their L1 are much more successful at picking yeah. up literacy reading and writing in their L2. And that's huge. We see that uh, every day in the school. 
Yeah, you know, so this if is, they have it, they transfer. This is also connected with what Ingrid said that basically uh, literacy may be uh, somehow a one unitary system, but when you have to kind of uh, uh, actually apply that uh, concretely, then you want to use either this language channel or that language channel, you know? So that's uh, for sure. Okay, is there anything else you want to add to this uh, question, number four? All right, if not, then thank you very much for your participation. And right now we're gonna go to our second uh, thing on, on our agenda, and that will be the presentation of Ying Kong. So she's gonna present a, an article to us. Uh, so uh, uh, hand please. Uh, yeah, Professor, uh, I just want to add that, uh, you know, this uh, discussion may be very important and helpful. So I will send this kind of summary uh, yeah. in the chat box so that everyone, it can be in, in a source for you to think about your final paper or opinion forum as well. He sent it to me as well, you know, so I, I want to get that a, a copy, yes, because uh, there was a, a, a some good issues there. Okay, so right now, what I want to do is to uh, have Yong uh, uh, Kong the, uh, the floor and the screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. All right, okay. All right, today I'm gonna to do the presentation on the research paper. Uh, okay. So uh, with the title, Translanguaging in the Middle School Science Classroom, Constructing Scientific Arguments in English and Spanish with these two authors. So first of all, I'd like to explain uh, the keywords that is the translanguaging, which we, we are very familiar with. The second one is emergent bilinguals. The third, uh, the third one that is scientific argumentation, social scientific issues. For these two keywords, I'd like to explain later. And then discourse analysis. Uh, the last one that is I added into the keywords explanation because at the first sight of this paper, I said language bracketing refers to the hierarchical trees of uh, constituent uh, uh, par parts in a morphological level. But actually after reading this paper uh, that the two authors present us with this uh, language bracketing referring to uh, that is dual language mode, such as the 50-50 or 10-90, uh, that is a dual language uh, uh, education paradigm. So I like to explain it, that is language bracketing. Okay, now, so the today's uh, agenda follows with this uh, IMRDR, that is introductory part. I like to explain, uh, the research background and some terminologies uh, followed by the methodological uh, framework and uh, research design. And then there's uh, the results of this uh, design. Also, uh, uh, there are some kind of discussions of these results. And the last but not least, I'd like to uh, share with you my reflections and also we'll have a question to discuss. All right, uh, before I introduce into the, uh, the paper, I'd like to say that there's a group of students called, uh, uh, that is CLDS, which means culturally, linguistically diverse students. Okay, and also uh, there's a framework for K-12 science education uh, published by National Research Council into, uh, in 2012. Okay, uh, that is the cover. So this uh, framework consists of uh, three intertwining dimensions. That is the first dimension, scientific and engineering practice. The second, uh, that is the cross-cutting concepts with the third one is disciplinary core ideas. 
for these core ideas, it refers to like physical science, life science, earth and space science, something like that. And also the cross-cutting concepts um, unifies the scientific engineering practice uh, with these kind of uh, uh, ideas. Okay, so uh, uh, that is the vision of the council uh, that's to uh, develop a student's uh, engineering and scientific uh, abilities uh, over multiple years of uh, schooling. Okay, so here's the, uh, that is arguments in the uh, framework that is, uh, the framework and the subsequent uh, standards will not lead to improvements in K to 12 science education unless the other components of the system, like curriculum, instruction, professional development, and assessment, change so that they are aligned with the framework's vision. So uh, I think that is the starting point of this research. So here comes the research questions. So according to the authors, uh, that is uh, uh, the research question focus on how does translanguaging as a pedagogical strategy facilitate. The first uh, is on teacher's perspective, that is teaching a uh, teacher framing of scientific argumentation. The second is on student's perspective, that is uh, for students participation in scientific argumentation. All right, so let's come to the uh, okay, the four purposes of translanguaging pedagogy. Uh, in fact, it's our, uh, our argument uh, uh, that is uh, 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 that is by Garcia and her colleagues in 2017. The four purposes of translanguaging that is number one to support learners as they engage with and comprehend complex content and uh, text. And the second uh, function or purpose is to provide opportunities for learners to develop linguistic practices for academic context. The third one is to make space for learner bilinguals and ways of knowing. The last one is to support learner bilingual identities and the social emotional development. Generally speaking, uh, the function or the purposes of translanguaging is based on uh, the linguistic and uh, the social uh, cultural uh, uh, aspect of translanguaging as well. All right, now uh, let's come to the uh, explanation of some terminologies. The first one that is uh, social scientific issues, uh, which I mentioned in the key, uh, keywords explanation, that is uh, to make use of a problems-based approach to science education that incorporates a controversial social issues with conceptual or procedural ties to science. Uh, so there's a, a kind of a connection or incorporation. Uh, yeah, second, a term uh, that is social cultural perspective on learning. Actually, it's a kind of interaction between uh, the individuals uh, and uh, themselves and uh, society and individuals. That is, this kind of interaction play a significant role in the teaching and the learning that occur within any educational settings. Okay, the third one is about scientific argumentation. I will elaborate this uh, uh, keywords. Uh, okay, by a uh, formula uh, which uh, was argued by these two scholars in 2008. Uh, that is uh, claim and evidence and a reasoning equals to an explanation. Uh, uh, to put it simple, that is, uh, if you want to explain something, if you have a, want to have a scientific argumentation, then you are supposed to add what you uh, do you know to how do you know that with why does your evidence support your claim. The two scholars also mentioned a kind of CER framework with uh, this Rubik. Okay. And also uh, let's come to the second part of this paper that is the methodology and the research design. Okay, so here comes the first one uh, that is the whole research based on 
uh, ethnographic method, okay, which put more emphasis on uh, interactional social linguistics and the participant observation. So uh, uh, there are okay, two stages of observation. Uh, that is pre-curriculum intervention and the curriculum intervention. As far as the research question are concerned, uh, uh, so on this stage, the paper just uh, uh, refine their questions into one that is on teacher's perspective on translanguaging. So for the study settings, uh, that is, uh, it is a middle school uh, that is adopting the 50-50 dual language uh, uh, education paradigm. Uh, that is a kind of language uh, bracketing paradigm. Okay. Uh, for the participants, uh, that is the science teacher, uh, Mr. Ramirez, uh, and the researcher uh, themselves with her uh, 46 seventh graders. Okay, they are all the uh, participant in this research. Uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, uh, oh, sorry. And for the curriculum, that is uh, uh, the four week reform oriented science curriculum unit. Uh, uh, with the approach of so social scientific issues. Uh, and in the framework of scientific argumentation, uh, aiming to promote the use of the discourse. Okay. And the theme of this curriculum is on biodiversity, focusing with, uh, on invasive and endangered species. Uh, there are three uh, case studies focusing on green turtle, Puerto Rican kwa, timber uh, rattlesnake. And the, for specific uh, pedagogical strategies, they are using think, pair, share, individually uh, in the group work and in the whole class. Uh, for, the, uh, okay, uh, for the material, okay, for the uh, uh, data sources, they are using video recording followed by secret uh, transcript. Right, so uh, the curriculum lesson description can be uh, 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 illustrated in table one. That is uh, this uh, table, okay. When we see here very clearly, that is our lessons and the lesson description, okay. From this table, uh, we may see there are 11 lessons with the, okay, with the, oh, sorry. So uh, with the first, the, uh, first, uh, lesson one, that is pre-assessment, lesson 11, that's a post-assessment. There are three case studies, that is lesson six, green turtle case, and lesson eight, uh, Puerto Rican qua case, and lesson 10, that is timber rattle case. And uh, between uh, each cases, there are the CER uh, uh, frame, frame, right? That is the our claim, evidence, and the reasoning. Mm -hmm. And also in each case, uh, there are the, the specific uh, pedagogical strategies uh, that is think, uh, uh, pair, and share, okay? So that is the uh, okay, basic description. And also for data analysis, uh, there are the episodes of uh, the videos, uh, okay? We may also see from this, that is there are exact time uh, date and type of class with class activities, a scientific practice description, and also uh, the researchers add their notes right here. Okay, uh, that is translanguaging. Okay. All right, so the third part is the results. Okay, from the data we collected uh, uh, in the research design, there are three major functions. The first one, the translanguaging, uh, the, that is uh, to maintain classroom culture, facilitating the academic task and uh, framing epistemic uh, practice. For this uh, function, okay, the paper just elaborated uh, into the expressions like uh, instances of teacher translanguaging to support members of the community learning to propose, justify, and evaluate knowledge claims related to scientific argumentation about social scientific issues. And focusing on this function, that is framing epistemic practices, 
uh, the, the paper just present us with some tables, okay? So this is the table three, okay? From this table, uh, we may see very clearly, clearly that is for uh, the first turn uh, in line one to line five, okay? Uh, there's a translanguaging uh, because, you know, uh, for line one to line four, there's English. And then just uh, switch the to Spanish, right, uh, to show Okay, that the 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 translanguaging okay, uh, to show uh, that is the function of reasonings right here, and also there's a translanguaging in line nine to ten. Uh, that is the author, uh, uh, the, the the teacher. Okay, just uh, uh, translanguaging from uh, English to uh, Spanish to uh, further or to clarify uh, the term claim right here. Okay. All right, so uh, for the first uh, turn, that is from line one to line 22, they also just, uh, the, sorry, the teacher just uh, used translanguaging uh, to clarify or to explain uh, uh, that is the function of uh, reasoning, okay? And also uh, uh, that, that is uh, the, okay, this part, okay, there are turn two to turn, uh, 10, okay, okay, is also used translanguaging uh, but serving for this uh, function of, okay, uh, that is uh, framing the epistemic uh, uh, practice. Okay, so, okay, here comes the table four and the table five, okay. Uh, so to wrap it up, okay, uh, that is the teacher used uh, translanguaging in her class, okay, uh, to, Okay, to serve the functions uh, that it mentioned uh, before, the three functions of uh, translanguaging practice in science uh, classroom. All right, here, here comes the fourth part that is the discussion. Okay, for translanguaging and the science education, uh, the researchers argue that translanguaging is a way of establishing instructional congruence by leveraging the authentic linguistic practices prevalent outside the classroom for use inside the classroom. Okay, so that is a kind of connection uh, between outside and inside the uh, classroom. And also translanguaging supports the logic of everyday sense making by using out of school linguistic practices as resources for learning inside the classroom. Okay, so as for the translanguaging, also it serves as uh, responsive teaching. Uh, that is, translanguaging should be employed in a linguistically responsive manner. Uh, so as we talk about responsive translanguaging, that it affords teacher linguistic flexibility in framing the knowledge and the practices of the classroom. So if we say there do exist the first space and the second space, which means out of school uh, discursive practices and the school discursive practices, then uh, the uh, third space, okay, that is uh, okay, uh, served by translanguaging, uh, uh, that is to shoulder the responsibility of, uh, of valuing and the leverage, uh, leveraging, okay. All right, now let's go back to the four purposes of translanguaging pedagogy, which we mentioned in the first part. All right, so it's a kind of supporting, providing, supporting, uh, uh, and making sp uh, space, okay? Uh, so, okay, as we just uh, okay, take the second uh, uh, look of, uh, that is translanguaging practice in, uh, science classroom of uh, uh, of middle school. So first of all, uh, so the translanguaging uh, in the teachers practicing, uh, it serves as providing opportunities for learners to develop their uh, academic context because it's a science science class, right? And also uh, to okay, foster the class the class culture, it's also supporting uh, the students to have their own identities and also their uh, uh, social cultural development. Okay, that is this uh, function. And as 
far as the framing epistemic uh, practice is concerned, uh, so it also serves the function of uh, comprehension, complex content, and the text. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, the translanguaging in science classroom uh, serves very well uh, with the function of uh, that is making space for the multi uh, 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 meta linguistic awareness and the ways of knowing. Okay, so this is the third, uh, the fourth one. Okay, all right. Here comes my summary of this paper. So this research investigation, uh, bilingual middle school science class, illustrates how language uh, translanguaging was employed as a pedagogical strategy as the teacher and her emergent bilingual students engaged in argumentation about social scientific issues. Uh, my reflection is focusing on teachers translanguaging practice, the integrated responsive pedagogical strategies occurred within bilingual speech community does foster a language and the content rich environment, which makes the real study happen. In this regard, it is highly teacher demanding. Okay. In other way, uh, the teachers uh, must uh, be uh, well prepared and uh, uh, qualified for this kind of uh, requirement. That is, they must uh, serve a lot of different roles, for example, as a co-learner, as a sky folder, as a sense maker, and also as a, a facilitator, so on and so forth. Okay, here comes a question. Uh, that is uh, basically is how to measure success, okay, specifically according to a book by Baker and Wright in 2021, uh, they arguing that measuring something like language proficiency and academic achievement are plagued with problems of definitions, ambiguity, validity, and reliability. So even if there's a comprehensive assessment system, how to measure the outcome of translanguaging practices is full of challenges. For example, uh, we have the problems of mirroring personality and identity development, self-esteem, uh, self cultural and ethnic participation, moral development and employment, et cetera. Then, if there's no neutral or value-free judgment on the effectiveness of bilingual education, how can we compare translanguaging to other pedagogical strategies in the classroom? So here's the question. Uh, I'd like you to share with uh, me uh, your enlight uh, enlightful ideas. All right, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, professor, you need to unmute first. May I ask a question that is not, it wasn't the focus of the article, but I've just been reading about it. And that is uh, teacher reluctance to use translanguaging. I think you briefly mentioned that because one of the problems, um, again, this is not the focus of the article, is teacher, teachers are reluctant to use it because the American educational system is still mostly monolingual using subtractive programs. Did, did, your, did the article mention that at all? Uh, I don't think the article mentioned about teachers reluctant to use it. It's about a kind of practice by using it in a science classroom. So yeah, I I'm, think that. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Professor. I just wanted to mention because it, 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 she didn't hear my comment because I was uh, muted. So I said uh, uh, that uh, the presentation was better than the article. In fact, you know, I think because uh, she really structured the presentation very well and highlighted all the points and everything. So. Uh, uh, it was really good to listen to that, you know, because it rarely happens when uh, the, the article that is not necessarily better than an uh, above average paper is presented this uh, uh, really uh, clear way, you know, where uh, the main points are highlighted. Yes, uh, uh, and 
Okay, so you answered Elaine's question. Uh, do you have, do others have any comments or questions to Ying Kong? I just wanted to raise another thing that I think was in the paper because I think Ying Kong said that there's uh, lesson one and lesson 11, right? Where pre and post test assessments of how the students uh, used argumentation or understood argumentation before and after. But I don't think that they, and I, I'm connecting that to a way of measuring success. So they are trying to teach the kids how to know uh, argumentation, for example, in science. They're not really talking about whether they learn anything and how they measure what they knew at pretest from what they learn at post-test. Is that, did I understand it correctly? There's no mentioning of any, um, any scores or how they progressed or how they were successful in that, right? Yes, that's right. There's no mentioning of any uh, assessment or evaluate, just uh, the, the practice in her classroom. So it looks to me like it was a missed opportunity because if they had a pre-test and a post-test, that would have been a neat way of showing a yes. Look, the students learned something and here's how we can measure it. Yeah, that's a good point, you know, because they missed the opportunity, in fact, you know. So this is a good point. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I I felt that missed opportunity too, but at the same time, I think they, they mentioned that this is like a, a larger study and that this paper was specifically concentrating on what the teacher was doing. So it's like they they laid out like their whole research project, which had pre-test and post-test. But then they said that this article is not going to be about the whole project. We're going to focus specifically on this aspect here of the, what the, of the you know what, how the teacher employs translanguaging as a discursive um, tool. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. I must have missed that. Yeah, it is it is mentioned. It was mentioned in the summary of uh, Ying Kong that. Uh, it is highly uh, teacher demanding, this kind of whole process that they describe. Yeah, here it is, yes. It is highly teacher demanding. Yes, you are right, uh, uh, Roberto, basically, that their focus is the, mainly the, what the teacher does and uh, uh, how the, uh, they have to or how they recommend to imply uh, like, uh, translanguaging. But they add, and I think that uh, given uh, what uh, they talk about, it is really highly teacher demanding. Anything else? What do you think about the application? So what they recommend that the way they recommend it, the, the methodological uh, activities there. I felt like some of the suggestions while very successful in this environment would be a challenge if the teacher and the students didn't share all the common languages. Because again, we're seeing an example of English Spanish bilingualism, um, but for many people working with emergent bilingual students, the educator doesn't share the languages with the students and the students don't share the language with each other. Um, so I think that's a potential limitation. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, the, the important thing is that uh, actually, we, 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 you uh, remember, I think, uh, question number, number two uh, today was about uh, methodologies. And here, you know, what we see is a, a, a relatively well structured methodology that you can use in a translanguaging class. And uh, the, the real uh, issue is that it is it is a lot of work. It's a hell of a lot of work, you know, to be prepared or to develop uh, a kind of well structured uh, classroom activities, you know, through uh, uh, fifty minutes or forty five minutes. So after all, uh, that's the reason why they mentioned that this is very highly uh, teacher demanding, basically. I absolutely agree with. 
because uh, all three options that I mentioned there, you know, this is basically option two. I think that another another um, important point here that they they emphasize this, and which I think is interesting for this application, but we have to think about how we could sort of transpose it to other um, educational contexts is when they talk about, because they're focusing on, si on concepts of science, the issue of content is very prominent. And um, they use translanguaging, but there is no um, overt focus on language. So they talk about that this is not, we're not worried about second language acquisition. We're just worried about um, the students understanding the content. So I thought it was interesting how they were able to, like from a grounded theory approach, um, you know, classify teacher discourse and how they scaffold uh, and use students L1 to teach, um, uh, you know, scientific concepts. But then I would think that if you're if you're going to transfer this to another type of, uh, you know, discipline, you need to always have that content which you're focusing on and not the language itself, right? Um, so that's that's um, one thing I guess that that I think is is important to to mention because we've been talking like talking about like translanguaging also for like learning languages, learning for a second language, but here it's like the of course. Uh, I think it's safe to say that it does help develop, but it's, um, I think, also important to point out that the, the pedagogy is not really focused on the language itself. It's focused on the content. Yeah. Definitely. So language was secondary, but you are right that even in this way, they may learn some language, of course, but that's not the priority, definitely the whole thing. Okay. And going back to finish, uh, Elaine mentioned the teacher reluctance, which was not mentioned in the paper there. Uh, and this uh, presented, I mean, this paper presented us with a, 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 a well-structured kind of approach to content uh, using translanguaging. And uh, we all agree that it requires a lot of work from the teachers. So, uh, definitely, it, 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 it might be the case that the teachers might be reluctant to kind of uh, invest uh, this enormous amount of energy to kind of create uh, a well-structured uh, class, you know, uh, when they focus on content area. So, uh, after all, uh, uh, teacher reluctance may be a uh, an issue here, you know, as far as the application of translanguaging is concerned, uh, rely on methodology option two that we discussed earlier. Okay, anything else you want to add to this uh, paper? If not, then thank you very much, Xing Kong. Uh, it was a good job, so thank you. We really appreciate it. All right, so right now it's uh, eight minutes to to fix so please return. Uh, uh, we know very well that uh, it has some kind of a political overtone too. Uh, we didn't want to deal with that, and this is not a priority because we want to kind of uh, look at that as a, a language phenomenon and that uh, as a pedagogical phenomenon, something you know that uh, we can use in the classroom or recommend that. So that was the. Uh, major issue that we have been uh, discussing, but of course uh, there is something else with this translanguaging and this uh, paper uh, uh, actually uh, addresses uh, some issues like that. So Uzo, please uh, make the presentation and then listen to this issue. It's a nice word, bilinguist. Yeah, this, this is a good word, Uso. Bilinguist. Okay, go ahead, unmute. Unmute. Uso, unmute. We don't hear anything. We haven't heard anything because you didn't 
Yeah. Yeah. Go, go back to the beginning because we haven't heard anything since you were muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So I'm sorry about that. So I am making my presentation on cross language as a pedagogy for equity of language minoritized students by Tuba Isman, Imaz. My name is, as you all know, Uso Chibuko. I'm a bilinguist. And as the presentation goes down, you know why I am a bilinguist. So let's do this. First of all, I would like to just explain a little bit who um, a language minoritized student is. So these are persons, they come from homes where a language other than what is maybe used in school for instruction and for engagements in school is different. So these people could be fully bilingual or just speak only one language at home, that's a native language, or just speak only English or speak mostly their home language that is their native language or a combination of maybe little English to add to it. So these are people that are classified as language minoritized students. Yeah, although the professor may mention that this is not much of a political um, emphasis, but permit me to just throw in a little bit of politics into it just to give some frame, then I will proceed to the classroom if um, aspect. So that in America here, uh, so much gaps exist. If you know there's a promise of equal opportunity for every student in the school to gain access to whatever is needed to give them their full, to develop their full potential. But then it's obvious that there's inequality and inequities in our school. And this is adding up to the widening opportunity gaps and even achievement gaps that um, is recorded in our assessments. So uh, in response to some of these, um, I tried to look back whether there's a legal framework and I found that the ESA Act is a law that was signed, an act that, signed, was, that was signed to law by Barack Obama in 2015. In this uh, federal legislation, it contained a number of provisions that kind of sought to see how equity could be achieved in our educational institutions so that people can be given all the resources they need or have access to them so that they're able to succeed. That's why the name is called Every Student Succeed Act. But then as we progress, I would like us to have this question in, in mind, this overarching question, do these provisions actually translate to resources that promote equity in the classroom and how? Let's keep this question in mind as we progress. I try to define equity. There are many ways people define equity in different contexts, but I want to just pick this one that say that equity means the policies and practices of an educational system that caters to students of all kinds, develops their educational experience accordingly. So that means that no matter where a student comes from, in spite of his language or race or socioeconomic status, disability or family history, that student has the opportunity to get the support and resources they need to achieve their educational potentials or goals. And this is where we are trying to see how we can build equity. But it's important we also know that equity is not the same as equality. There are two different things. Equality could be in a situation whereby everyone has equal allocation of the same resources in equal amounts. Whereas equity is where everyone has access to what is actually needed. It's clear, and I want us to bear em emphasis on this equity as in the terms of, in the, in the line of uh, our discourse, translanguaging, do students actually have access to what they actually need to benefit from the exercise of translanguaging in the classroom? Trying to explain further what an equitable student could mean, I try to see it as um, when teachers are able to provide services that students actually need in my special education classroom, we call it differentiated work, so that you give students access to instruction based on their skill level. It's not like a one size fits all, not what for Mr. A, what's for Mr. B. So how do I, as a caring educator, provide instruction, teach content in a way that my students, in spite of their, their respective linguistic background, are able to assess or be engaged in the learning experience in the classroom. 
So the question then is, does trans language help me achieve this in any way as an educator? So I'd like you to just listen to this story by um, Aubrey. He's, a, he's a, um, a teacher in a school. So he narrated an experience that happened. He says, one day at recess, a distraught five-year-old approached me and proclaimed angrily, forgive my, my Spanish way of speaking. He says, flanito mi tago. So the teacher was confused and he attempted to hear, uh, he attempted to understand what the, the child, the student was saying. He touched you, she shook her head. He attacked you, no again. The teacher was grateful. But then frustrated, the student replied, mi tago like in tag maestra. So in that moment, it just realized that he had been activating half of her lingu his linguistic repertoire. So that while the student had been leveraging all of hers, converting the English verb tag into a grammatically correct Spanglish phrase to express her outrage that a classmate had attacked her in the playground game. At this moment of clarity, the teacher began to wonder about the real risk for the students if they were never exposed to the benefits of translanguaging as a resource for their language and literacy learning. So that in this reflection, um, the teacher tries to, it reveals the tension that many dual language educators face when planning for language in their classroom. On the one hand, teachers are tasked with upholding the program's language allocation policies, just like the the first speaker said in our presentation today, she mentioned that, that the work of translanguaging is teacher demanding. This is where it plays out in clear sense here. So what does Yema say? So in discussing the Yema paper, there are some words that were so prominent, bilingualism, translanguaging, microacquisition, language, microcidence, equity and social justice, monoglossia, heteroglosia, diglosia, triglosia, and so on. But these words, I won't bore you with explaining them one by one. Rather, they will be explained as time as we progress and explained in the context. There are, some, there are also some concepts here. The monoglossic language ideologies, the heteroglossic language ideologies of bilingualism, then translanguaging as a transformative pedagogy aimed at promoting equity in a classroom. The background. So Yilmaz uh, tried to um, take us to the background of how translanguaging came into being. Uh, he mentioned uh, the West educators and Williams who propounded that, that um, translanguaging is a pedagogical practice or two that enables them to apply more than one language in, in, you know, for receptive or productive use. He also propounded that uh, as a teaching method, translanguaging is useful in bilingual programs to promote students' bilingualism and enhance their academic attainment. Then Garcia extended the conversation by saying that translanguaging is very, very helpful in, scaffold, in scaffolding bilingual content and language learning and to give them a voice in schools that is dominated by monolingual language policies and monoglossic ideologies by incorporating their complex unitary linguistic repertoire and identities. And these identities are very, very important. And again, it's not just about the content, it's also about the language, because when translanguaging is in effect in the classroom, the vocabulary of the students in the language of instruction is increased, is widened, while at the same time, the student is making an inroad into understanding the content of uh, that is being taught in the classroom. So translanguage to, um, to learn a language or are we translanguaging to learn about content or for both? I would say it's for both, but as we progress, we, it becomes clearer. So another question that comes to my mind is, at this point is how does monoglossia ideology affect bilingual in a monolinguistic classroom? I would like to pay attention or um, talk more about monoglossic ideological uh, perspective of bilingualism. 
is kind of a system whereby it, it, it's a, a language is chosen to be the official language of use in an environment. And uh, Brof, uh, Brut Griffler referred to it as macro acquisition, which is like a social engineering linguistic process of making a whole speech community adopt a second language. Yilmaz called it, um, um, spoke about, about this, about this uh, aspect as being an appropriation of English language by speakers all over the world. And he mentioned specifically Asia and Africa where um, monoglossic ideology is more predominant. For instance, in my country, Nigeria, English is a lingua franca. Any student cannot gain admission into any tertiary institution like university or college unless the student passes his or her English language um, exams. That's an example of what Imas was talking about here, like be English being an appropriated language that has taken dominance over and above even the native language of some communities and the whole speech community. Here in America as well, English language is both the official language of instruction and assessment and has come with its own attendant issues for language minoritized students. So monoglossia is actually rooted in what uh, um, in the linguistic linguistic in the uh, linguistic prejudice Prejudice in the sense that English language here in America is the language of power and prestige. And it looks at English as one major language that everyone has to walk towards to, to learn and all that. So it's, it's a vivid evidence in our school here. You teach in English, assessment is in English, everything is English. But then the question is, how do those who were defi defined earlier as emerging bilinguals or language minoritized students who maybe know about their home language or little of English language, how do they fit in and benefit from the every student succeed at that should make provision for them to be successful in the school. So mono, monoglossic um, ideology follows a very sub, follows a subtractive bilingualism, whereby, for instance, a student who speaks Spanish, Spanish at home comes to the school, the Spanish is taken out, and English becomes the language of instruction, assessment. Whatever communication in the school becomes English. Gradually, the Spanish students or other language that are spoken at home begin to lose their grip on the student. And he loses all that and becomes conditioned to the new language or the target language or language of use in the school. So the result is that the Latino child speaks only English at the tail end. Contrasting it to the additive bilingualism, where the two languages go hand in hand, which is very, very helpful, because the whole essence of trans language does not mean to uh, demean the old language. Rather, it is allowing the two languages to go on, because people who are bilingual tend to be, have more cognitive strength in terms of the analysis, in terms of their creativity, in terms of the ability to see things from different perspectives. And Yemas was then saying that bilingualism from a monoglossic perspective means mastery of two separate and distinct languages. So that he now said that it also promotes the idea of diglossia, which is a social arrangement where language has a higher prestige and the other has a lower, a lower, lower prestige, if you like, or lower power or influence. So this is the principle we, like I said before, happens in our schools every day. And I don't think um, we have answers to that yet. The next one is the heteroglossic um, perspective of bilingualism. Here language is seen as a contested space or a single undifferentiated cognitive terrain. This is simply because the bilingual is not two persons that is speaking two different languages. The bilingual is just one and same person, but he's able to deploy, he's able to employ or put to use all his linguistic resources or repertoire of knowledge in, in language to respond to the immediate communication needs he has in the classroom. And that is the whole essence of the heteroglossic ideology in bilingualism. 
And that's what I went for to say and talk about the dynamic bilingualism, which is development of fluid language practices in order to achieve communicative goals and make meaning by transcending the socially historical and politically defined boundaries between named languages. It's, Garcia's position is all about making meaning out of situation. The former speaker, the, the first presentation talked about bringing um, um, knowledge from outside into the classroom. So this student, who, this bilingual student is able to make this transition in a fluid manner connect what's outside with what's going inside the classroom once translanguaging is properly facilitated and harnessed in the classroom. So that bilinguals use their lingu linguistic repertoire in making meaning, deepening their understanding and expressing themselves within their operational space. Continuing, you could imagine a situation whereby in the classroom, for instance, a teacher, Mr. Zodema, walks into the classroom, gives students some videos to watch on their iPad about a content in the native language before a content is introduced in the class. And as Uzodema does this, he has on his chart all the various vocabularies in different languages because he knows, for instance, in the classroom, we have a student that is Spanish, we have a student that is also from China, and we have a student that is from Nigeria. He tries to put these words in different languages on the board, on the anchor chart, and put them on the board while they watch these videos. So the chances are that these students are able to make connections easily, and they could gradually, even while watching the video before the class begins, <coughs> they're able to make some connections to both the language of instruction and the content because they have learned some words prior to the teaching. This is why translanguaging requires resources and time to make it happen. So that Yilmaz talks about translanguaging as a theoretical, a theoretical lens and an effective pedagogy that can force language minority students, content and language learning, and empowers their authentic language practices. Just like I mentioned, is it like a tax? I remember when I was uh, um, in a decent, decent five program it, about three years ago, I had a, a, a mixture of students from different, different uh, countries, actually. I said, how do I engage? I didn't know, it, I, I didn't know about this as called translanguaging, trans but I just wanted to know what happens if we could talk about family, because I know family is a common concept everyone knows because we all come from family. I wish I knew the name was translanguage language design. I didn't know that we are doing this practice in social studies class. So the aim was discuss family, put them in different groups, and then you write what you think a family is. After you have written, discuss, then write, just like we did in the, you know, in the first session today. I noticed that some students who were unable to talk, like who could raise their hands up and answer questions when we were uh, having a group general class uh, discussion, were busy talking in this small group. That was really refreshing to me. I took note in my, in my journal. Now I'm trying to um, have a, a reminiscence of that activity. I now saw that translanguaging really is empowering the authentic lane of bilinguals and the signals if it's in the classroom. Therefore, the question will now be again, how will educators leverage translanguaging to promote equity in the classroom? One, uh, you must listed the flowing, flowing points, that flexible use of linguistic resources by bilinguals in order to make sense of their words. They're able to make connections using their own words. And that bilinguals translanguage to engage in complex discursive practices very clear to construct meaning and acquire deep understandings so these are one of the things i think i think translation does in the classroom it empowers students to be bilingual or multilingual it encourage it encourage it encourages belongingness and sense of participation of the language 
minority students. So trans language is very effective because it creates a culturally respectful learning environment. Everyone tolerates everyone and it promotes inclusion, equity, and diversity. So overall, why do we trans language? What do we trans language and how? First, mobilize multiple language languages to process the content by the teacher, communicate using multiple languages in the same sentence or in, in the text, use words, phrases, sentences from another language to communicate. Reason, the aim is to support students to be bilingual, increase students' comprehension, empower students to participate, overall engagement. This can be done by allow students to read or view their home language resources, encourage students to collaborate using their home language, display home language alongside English, okay? You can as well send messages to families so that can, they can be part of the learning community, so they can even reinforce whatever is done in school at home. Translanguaging trans also as a, as a pedagogy for equity, uh, education equity is also very important here. We look at translanguaging helps teachers <clears throat> to allow students to employ their linguistic forms of knowledge as a scaffolding tool to achieve content learning. English language learners, they will respond far better when they feel that their native language is valued and respected in the classroom. I will see go back to the first presenter she mentioned that translanguaging is teacher dependent. I have in my class last year, um, a student from China, a Chinese student. On one occasion, he was all over the place. Once I come in, I say to him, Ni hao. He, he, he gets excited, comes towards me. I have to go learn this because, uh, permit me to use his name. His name actually is not, is not Zim. I don't have permission to use his name here. I call him Zin, come over here. He will reluctantly come. But when I say, the how he comes. So language has a way of strengthening bilinguals and stimulate their engagement, even motivation, knowing that someone in the classroom can connect with them through the vehicle of language. So as the pedagogy, Emerging bilinguals need a test space in the classroom. This test space, Yilmaz talked about it as a place teachers have to create this, make this space happen so that students are free to express themselves, discuss based on the content, and students are allowed or encouraged to deploy their full linguistic repertoire in analyzing, discussing, sharing their thoughts about the content and this ties into Vygotsky's theory of learning and development, where he said that actual development of a learner or of learners is defined by independent problem solving abilities and the potential development under an adult guidance and collaboration with more capable peers. So in the classroom to apply translanguaging as a pedagogical tool that will facilitate or foster equity, teacher can put small groups, those who may be more proficient in English, and those who are not too proficient in English language, they could make some discussion about a topic and ask them to do a report based on the content, based on the story, based on the text. That will allow them to have peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, which is very effective in the classroom in small group tasks, so that those who are more proficient in English could share or mentor their colleagues, their classmates who are less proficient in English. And at the same time, those who are less proficient could also benefit from those who are more proficient. So it becomes a collaborative exercise. And according to Lee Vigosti, this is a place where potential potential development begins to be harnessed by the classroom teacher so that eventually as educators, he will appropriate the experiences and harness them in order to support the child, the student to attain his actual developmental goal in academics or in education. And that's the goal of instruction, which is to foster 
English language learners are multilingual learners, the autonomy and the ability to engage in activities that enable them to apply and modify what they have learned to new situations that are the whole essence of translanguaging. Again, translanguaging in the classroom provides adequate access to resources and fair assessment. We have always had the issue in the discussion in the classroom, the issue of assessment. So UMass is saying that translanguaging, knowing fully well that we have people with different backgrounds linguistically and otherwise. Therefore, it beggars the question to use summative assessments like we do in the school, following the monoglossic perspective. Rather, it benefits the student and even the assessment community to apply formative assessment so that students are measured using dynamic assessment practices, which should be prepared based on students' classroom practices and differentiated based on individualized needs of students. That's the question of Garcia. And this is very practical and very effective because in the small group task, the teacher who is the facilitator sees the effort, the ongoing effort of these students. He's able to assess them. He's able to grade them. He's able to give feedback and possibly growth will be more, more will be highly rocketed and begin to build up their proficiency in literacy, for instance, so that the achievement gap could also be bridged. So as a principle, in trans language in pedagogies should be purposefully designed and implemented. So it has to be a conscious and intentional enterprise by the teacher. The aim is to get everyone have equal access to what they need. Then trans language in pedagogies should promote interaction and inclusion so that students are able to collaborate, work together and share from the funds of their knowledge based on the content, be able to disseminate the information among, among themselves so that the entire community benefits from it. That's what part of the third question we answered today about the investments this, um, the bilinguals bring to the classroom. When they come to the classroom, they embody an academic capital, which they invest. This investment is their identities their socio-cultural backgrounds, their ideologies, their linguistic repertoire. These are the social capital they invest in the classroom. And it's for the teacher to harness, disseminate, and make sure everyone benefits so that the class begins to form, function in a culturally respectable manner. And class language in pedagogy should enrich learning across all of the languages in the student's repertoire. That's why it is fully teacher dependent. He needs to prepare the lessons, prepare for translanguaging, prepare for the content, get the materials needed to ensure students have equal access to the content of instruction. Translanguaging, according to Yimas again, to build equity in education of language management students requires teachers to affirm students' bilingual identities by validating their diverse cultural and linguistic experiences. So that this space we mentioned about is created where they can have a voice and express or share their experiences. After all, the goal of trans language as a transformative pedagogy includes affirming the language minoritized of their unique identities, like we mentioned earlier, by creating safe learning environment where they are not denigrated or made to feel inferior. That's why Talking about pedagogy as a means to achieve equity, you cannot run away from pursuit of social justice. It's like, a, it's like a fight to ensure social justice in the classroom. No one should be denigrated or made to look inferior on account of his language or, his, or how he speaks or the surrounding environment that he or she embodies while in the classroom. That is a safe environment we're talking about. So that translanguaging, in the classroom will combat, according to Yilmaz, structural inequalities, wrestling implicit bias or stereotypes and such ills that reinforce educational inequities, uh, inequities. So that no one will just look at the student and say, oh, he is, this language is difficult for him to learn. He is uh, not proficient in this language. As I don't think I will have to waste resources on this student, no. 
past language in terms, in terms. So systematically fight, put a no, a nip in the board, all those structural barriers to equity in the classroom. And again, it challenges the hegemony and the linguistic imperialism of standard languages like English in the schools. So that he empowers, it empowers the role of language minority students in the classroom or group discussions, encouraging language minority students' parents to be also a part of their children's education. Um, Andy was talking about how he connects with the parents at home to make sure they are part of the learning community or that their, kids, their children benefit. That's part of the whole process. That's trans language in Rive. The reality. The legislation promised a whole lot resources available to the child so that no child is denied access to resources needed to succeed in school. But do these promises translate to action in our schools? So sometimes emerging bilinguals will require more time to transition to the official language of instruction in school. Do schools schedule factors like this for these students in need? Again, Translanguaging is a transformative pedagogy and it happens daily in our classrooms. Sometimes we don't even know when it happens, but does it happen? It does happen. So by what conclusion and reflection, following Yilma's, Yilma's position, he said that translanguaging is a transformative ideology addressing the equity of language minoritized students in education promoting language minority students bilingualism and values their full linguistic repertoire rather than undervaluing their flexible language practices. It increases students' academic achievement by using students' linguistic resources as a scaffolding tool for content and language learning. It affirms bilingual identities and creates thought spaces in which they can promote their bilingual identities by creating new realities. Finally, it structures the classroom to give voices to students. To achieve this, it equalizes the status of languages spoken in the classroom, and it tends to increase participation of both students and parents into the decision-making uh, process, processes. These are the questions I have. There are so many, but I limited it to these six. How does monoglossy ideology affect English language learners and multilingual learners in a monolinguistic classroom? Do educators have enough resources to provide equitable translanguaging that benefit emerging bilinguals in our classrooms? Is there flexibility in the language of instruction in your own school in such a way or manner that emerging bilinguals are reasonably supported? How does standardized tests impact language minoritized students' academic achievements? How can educators promote translanguaging as a tool for socio-academic justice? Does every Student Succeed Act provide adequate resources needed to achieve equity for all students? And why, if not? We can end oh. it now. Thank you, Uzo. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And all right, so uh, give me give us back the uh, screen where you have your questions. Oh, oh, sorry. One second, sorry. Uh, we have like six, seven minutes for questions and discussions because we have to give time to uh, Tung also to give his presentation. So. Uh, you can either answer any of these questions or you can make any comments based on the article. So please uh, I go have, ahead. I have a yeah. comment that, you know, it was really important is that translate, you have to promote an environment that makes, doesn't make students feel inferior. And even at the adult level, I have students who feel that if they use their native language, it means that they have a deficit in English, you know, that deficit approach. So that's what I, th I think having the monolingual environment, if you can't 
produce a word in English, there's something wrong if you have to draw on your other languages. So, and I think that's related to two because I don't have enough resources. And I think most schools aren't equipped, you know, to have the resources for translanguaging because I, to the best of my knowledge, it's not a standard in most public education. So, and I think that is related in a sense to five um, because if it's not valued, uh, it's not, the environment is not produced for translanguaging. And so again, that makes students feel inferior perhaps. And I think that if they could bring their language in, it would promote their literacy in both language. And it would also, um, you know, for example, a student might not want to speak up and answer a question because they're they're not sure of the vocabulary. And if they feel that they can answer questions because they can use their own language also, um, you know, it, it advances their literacy. Uh, you know, and it you know it's much better than them just not answering the question because they feel inferior because they don't have all the words for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk about number five as well. Um, I think that um, what we really need to do is answer that that is a how question. And one thing that I think we're um, we can and already do do is implement technology to allow for um, newcomer students to use things like Google Translate, which can actively live translate documents so that we can still see if they're understanding math concepts, even if the language might not connect. So there are ways that we can help give students those initial, the initial tools to help continue their learning. But, you know, eventually that, that, that scaffold has to, has to leave. So, and Again, getting that kind of technology out to um, to classrooms that have exceptionally diverse linguistic populations or massive pop populations where you know the the cost uh, would make it impossible to implement. Okay, anything else? Yes, you know, this is quite a difficult question. I mean, we have said here several times that, of course, translanguaging has a lot of positive sides. Uh, but there is one thing that we should think about, the need for languages. So why is it that nowadays, uh, you know, everybody uh, wants to learn English? That is one simple reason that uh, people coming from different parts of the world, they want to communicate with each other. So if I live in Hungary and I don't speak English, only Hungarian, I cannot communicate with anybody. Absolutely. Pro Professor, if I may, one of our problems, though, is we have kids coming here who don't want to learn English. Yeah, so th that's a huge problem because, you know, I mean, uh, there is a need for some kind of common communication tool. I don't care if that language is Yorkshire or German or uh, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but, but I must acknowledge that I need a, a language to communicate with, with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, because maybe maybe my language is not that uh, people know too much. You know, so that that's that's a real uh, issue here. That that's the reason where, because we hear and read about all kinds of uh, linguistic imperialism. Look at, for example, South Africa. They have 23 different languages that are officially recognized. But what can they do with that? They introduced English as the language of education all over the country. Why did they do that? And that's for political reasons, necessity. Excuse me, they want to talk with each other. I mean, you know, people speak 20 different languages. How can they communicate with each other? You cannot provide education in all these 23 languages 
or India, for example, or Nigeria, my friend Uzo. You know, you have also more than 50 different languages. So why do you think, you know, that uh, English is English is a tool for you to talk, communicate with everybody in the country, you know? So it is, English is not bad. I mean, again, I don't care. What is the, my opinion is that as far as English is concerned, the main reason that English is the language that everybody else, so it is, it is not political. It's because English brings together the two biggest branches of Indo-European languages. Uh, the Germanic branch and the Neo-Latin branch, you know? And this is a combination of these uh, two huge branches. No other human language does that, you know? So after all, uh, and that's the reason why it is so easy and, you know, so many people pick it up and, you know, we, we made it for a common language all over the world. And we need that. Of course, we can make a decision and say, all right, from... Uh, Tomorrow, uh, we're going to decide that our common language will be Lithuanian. All right. So let's everybody learn Lithuanian. But let's not politicize it at the hand with this uh, terrible uh, colonizing language like English. You know, let's just leave it behind and select another language. We can do that. And I don't care if we can do that. But the question is, can we do that? Do we have the resources to do that? You know, so that's the, can we say in in the uh, in, in in a country like India that okay the the hell with the English language, let's just select one of the uh, uh, seventy something languages in India and that will be the common language. Do you know what would happen? War, people would start to kill each other. You know, because you know why do you select this language and not my language or whatever? Who wants that? So, you know, this, this is, there are practical reasons that we lead that it's not political at all, it's, it's practical. You have to communicate with each other. In China, you know, you have, I don't know how many different languages. And of course, you know, you need a common language. So Mandarin is something, if you go to Gonzo, and you know, the, the people speak, uh, not necessarily Mandarin, that in the restaurant or in the street or whatever, but in the education institution, you know, you have to use Mandarin, period. You know, because you want to communicate with each other. So everybody is bi-dialectal somehow, you know, or bilingual or uh, uh, multilingual. So, you know, what we, what we should do and continue doing is to kind of have one common language and another language, you know? So definitely, that, that, that's the right way to do that. The common language is needed because I want to communicate with with uh, Rabindi, you know, who comes from Sri Lanka. And if I, uh, if she doesn't speak Hungarian and I don't, uh, I don't uh, speak her language. So the only way we can communicate in English. So wonderful that I can communicate with her, you know? And of course, uh, again, we have to look at that from a practical purpose. And uh, going back to, to translanguaging, that, uh, as we have said several times, uh, our goal is to find its place in our education system. How can we kind of use that in an effective way? That's the real question that we have to decide. It's not that we have to uh, uh, say that uh, we don't want to deal with that, uh, but it's also not that this should be our priority. You know, I don't think so. It is a very useful tool it's a very uh, good thing, you know, that supports a lot of things, not only just uh, acquiring content and understanding things, but at the same time, I also uh, acknowledge that it helps uh, uh, to develop the self-identity of students, you know, and uh, it is a, a good feeling, you know, when they say that, see that their first language is uh, uh, accepted and it's useful for a particular purpose. So that's, that, that's what, is important for us as, as, as educators, you know, and we have to look at the, the, the best way how we can use that. Okay, I'm sorry I spoke too much. All right, so uh, thank you. And uh, what we want to do right now is, uh, th thank you so again for the presentation. And then uh, we have a half an hour for uh, Tung's presentation. So Tung, please take over the screen. Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, so I hope that you will enjoy the very last presentation today. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad to, uh, to be able to present my interview with, uh, with a teacher in Vietnam. Uh, and he is um, exercising uh, a lot of agency in order to employ the Chinese language in his classroom uh, in the context of K-12. So, uh, so today, uh, the agenda of my uh, interview presentation is um, uh, comprised of uh, my interview's purposes and objective. Uh, the second one is about my interviewee uh, in terms of academic background and teaching experiences. Uh, and the third one is about his working context. And the last one is about what has been learned from the, from the interview. So uh, first, uh, I would like to say something about uh, my interview purposes and objective. So, uh, I want to. Uh, I want the uh, the objective uh, to involve three things. Um, the first of which is to acquire a better understanding of a native speaker teachers, understanding of translanguaging. Uh, and the second one is uh, to unfold uh, an insight into how practical translanguaging can be in a K twelve setting of English as the second or third language in a native English speaking country. And the last one is to propose some directions for development of translanguaging practices in the gifted K-12 education of English um, or foreign languages. So, uh, so this is my uh, interviewee, um, and he he is my um, he's my friend in California, uh, and he's actually a um, Vietnamese American, but he was born and raised in California. Uh, but after his undergraduate um, graduation, he decided to move to Vietnam to work. And, and he has also obtained some teaching credentials in Vietnam as well. Uh, but very interestingly, uh, although he is an, um, a Vietnamese American, he is only fully able to listen to Vietnamese, uh, but he cannot speak Vietnamese at all. Uh, in addition to that, uh, his English is a native speaker. Uh, he's a native uh, English speaker. He's, uh, he's able to communicate in French, uh, uh, Spain, uh, Japanese, and, and a little bit Vietnamese. And he has got a, a history degree in UCLA. Uh, and he is working now uh, at Vietnam National University, but uh, he's working for the, uh, for the uh, high school for the gifted only. And he, he used to uh, visit National University of Singapore to earn his uh, teaching credential as well. Uh, and he has a wide range of teaching experiences including um, the California public K-12, uh, Vietnam-based private EOT centers, and uh, some of high school um, located in Vietnam. So uh, I would like to talk about um, his school, his, his current uh, school where he's teaching now. Uh, and uh, this is uh, his school. And uh, the, uh, this is a Vietnamese name, but the English name is for, uh, Foreign Languages um, Specialized School. And this page, this high school belongs to um, the University of Languages International School. And this university is a member of Vietnam National University. So about this school, uh, foreign, uh, foreign, uh, foreign, foreign, foreign languages uh, school and its philosophy, um, the school is aimed at enhancing the foreign second language proficiency for the Vietnamese gifted students. Uh, and, and aim at training the foreign language major students to become proficient in terms of both the foreign languages and the mainstream subjects at the high school level. And the second thing is uh, to develop the students' personal attributes and social skills, which are necessary for them to succeed in the later phases of their life. Uh, uh, so uh, these, uh, these expectations are closely aligned with the framework of attribute and academic proficiency specifically designed for the foreign language gifted student uh, developed by the, uh, this high school. So uh, about the program structure of uh, this uh, high school. Uh, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different from the mainstream because uh, this is the foreign, foreign language uh, specialized school and the students are like primarily major in foreign languages. However, in addition to focusing on the first foreign languages, the students are encouraged to take another, I mean the second foreign languages, uh, in order to, to, to develop their language proficiency more comprehensively 
uh, but they are still entitled to uh, following the um, Ministry of Education training curriculum and principle in order to graduate from high school. And the school has offered up to seven languages, uh, foreign languages. Uh, so in addition to English, they also train the students to uh, develop their Chinese, uh, French, Russian, Korean, Japanese, and German languages. So the students, uh, in addition to following the primary foreign language, they are still entitled to choose one foreign language in this list in order to consider to consider as a second foreign language in the curriculum. So, uh, so they are entitled to um, up to two foreign languages during the program, and they have to follow these foreign languages throughout the three years of their high school experience. So my interview. Uh, so uh, during the interview, I had a total of two interviews. Um, so um, my goals was to um, unfold um, his understanding of trans languaging and its underlying, underlying principles of trans, trans languaging practice. Um, also, I would like to focus on his personal reflections on his trans languaging practices. And the third one is about his lesson learned from his trans languaging practice in future direction. So um, before I want to share with you my interview findings, I just want to um, I just want to share that um, although trans languaging is very um, it's not a common practice in Vietnam because we are still following the monolinguistic uh, learning culture, uh, but um, his teacher, this teacher is very unique in terms of uh, his interest and uh, his design to um, expand his notion of trans languaging into the gifted high school context. And he is willing to introduce the trans languaging practices that he learned from his um, undergraduate program and his teaching uh, credentials in different contexts uh, in order to into his classroom. And he wants to encourage his colleagues in the school to apply and to employ the trans languaging practices in their classroom as well. So that's why I think um, 70 to 80% of his teaching practice is primarily based on his understanding of trans languaging practices. So um, I have a total of three teams uh, that respond to the interview uh, findings. So the first one is about um, how he can define trans languaging uh, practices properly in response to teach uh, in response to his teaching context so uh, he used to say like his first impression his first impression is that trans languaging constitute simply the um, the many languages to be used within a particular course of communication between two or more people it's kind of code switching to allow the users to feel comfortable in employing the certain linguistic codes of one language to deliver uh, their target message pertaining to a shared spoken and written discourse. However, working with a wide range of foreign languages, major students for a wide variety of non-academic purpose, I truly find that trans languaging is more than face values, it's uh, stereotypically seen and understood, instead involving, involving the trans languaging practices of varying capacity and uh, capability in terms of taking fully or par partially control of the language code and structure based on the language related permission. So uh, based on the uh, this uh, interview finding, I, um, I want to highlight that uh, there is a connection between the multilingual, uh, uh, multilingual um, repertoire uh, with the two other phases of his trans languaging practices. Uh, the first one is about the intervention of the social context. And the second one is about multilingual uh, resources. I mean, like the speakers of different languages in the classroom. Uh, so in his teaching classes, um, he has so many students uh, having very different uh, linguistic background and linguistic uh, focus. Uh, therefore, he wants to engage his students in a more equitable classroom. It means that they, uh, he, he wants to, uh, he wants his students to define that uh, his students have full uh, voices to be heard 
and to employ their uh, multilingual resources in order to speak and to write languages uh, properly. So that's why rather than he consider his students as like just um, speakers of different languages, but he consider his students as very useful and very helpful resources in order to inspire uh, the students um, each other. And he wants to uh, proceed to the next stage of utilizing these resources properly in order to convey in, in, in order to generate new knowledge of language. Uh, and the second theme that I have learned from the interview finding is uh, the importance of multilingualism. So uh, as I said before, um, his, his students are very diverse linguistically and culturally. So that's why uh, he's focused on utilizing the multilingual resources uh, in order to develop a, um, a, a more equitable and more inclusive classroom um, and uh, he further noticed that it is very important for him to fight against the ideal native speaker of each of the language involved. So uh, that means he is really interested in making, uh, in allowing his learners to make progress and uh, to advance so as to get closer to the native speaker. But most of them never achieve the same language of native nativeness. Uh, as their models. So that's why regardless of their first foreign language, uh, he's still able to encourage his students to use um, uh, the language properly in a way that responds to their uh, prior experiences and their interest to develop the linguistic code. And the second one, in, according, in accordance with the multilingualism, um, his idea is to look at the different ways uh, that his learners tend to use their languages without comparing with the ideal native speakers of different languages. So um, from this theme, I just want to highlight the fact that the native speaker is not, it should not be a big problem in his class, in his classroom, but he focused on developing uh, his learners linguistically and culturally. Um, so uh, that should be a, a priority of his teaching in the classroom. Uh, so uh, also about the multilingualism, um, he, he says that thanks to uh, his students' second and third languages experiences, uh, his, his learners' uh, linguistic uh, trajectories should be richer and more dynamic, and they should involve cognitive, social, and emotional aspects. Um, secondly, his learners tend to use different languages depending on the context, and they can also use resources from different languages in some context. And this is a, a very good advantage for them because uh, they are more than encouraged to utilize their first foreign language and a little bit their third foreign language in the classroom in order to, in order to interact with each other and to generate new knowledge uh, responding to the lesson. And the third one is about uh, his learners who seem to succeed in navigating between languages and not using each of the languages for the same purposes in no means of communication in the same domains and with the same people. So uh, this means like he wants to, um, to give his learners a sense of agency and autonomy to decide what languages should be a priority in each uh, communication purpose. Uh, so based on, based on that, uh, he, he concluded that he wants to expand his belief about multilingualism based on the three factors. The first one is about he wants his learners to activate and to utilize their prior knowledge in terms of language and cultural understanding. The second one, they should be able to scaffold the understanding of how to use language properly and how to expand their cultural understanding in the, in the given context of communication. And the third one, he, they should be able to decide how to roll their linguistic background and how to roll their themselves as a, as a as a speaker of as a speaker of language rather than just purely rely on the native speaker model um, modeling. Uh, and the uh, the third uh, theme is about translanguaging as a form of pedagog pedagogy. So uh, in this theme, uh, it is very interesting for me to find that. Um, 
uh, a Christian um, is, is a person who, who is really active to learn in order to teach in the classroom based on his search of understanding about his students' cultural background and prior knowledge about language. Um, and after his uh, sound understanding of his learners, he is willing to integrate the appropriate and effective teaching pedagogies in his classroom. Um, and he's also very interested in doing research based on his sense of learning and his sense of teaching in order to, to develop continuously the teach, his teaching practices. And the last one, he wants to engage his learners in the community uh, services in a way that translanguaging should be um, a proper and should be a more popular means of teaching, learning, and researching within the school, not just about the communicative or not just about the native speakerism uh, modeling uh, as traditionally um, applied in Vietnamese uh, K-12 setting. Uh, so he, in order to do that, he focused on his students' ability in first activating their prior knowledge in acquisition of other languages. Uh, the second one, he wants to reflect on language in order to see how language work uh, rather than just comparing themselves with the native speaker. So in order to do so, he encouraged his students to examine similarity and differences among the languages in his students', in his students multilingual mind. And the last one, I just want to repeat what I have just um, said before. Uh, he wants to evaluate and manipulate language that is being used to change uh, cognitively, emotionally, and behaviorally. So based on this diagram, I just want to say uh, the pedagogical translanguaging in his practice is primarily um, affected by the connection between the multilingual competence that he wants he, he expects his students to perform and the multilingual resources available in his teaching context, including his uh, teaching classrooms. So uh, to con um, in conclusion, he says, it's really hard to repeat a certain translanguaging pedagogy on a regular basis because they need to be continuously planned, developed, innovated, and flexible employed. So he would tend to rely on points of time, differences of classroom setting, preferences of student, divergences of student background, objective to program a lesson, and negotiation between the student um, and, and him. So uh, his, uh, and from, from this quote, um, I, 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 I learned that uh, he's very uh, flexible and he's willing to, uh, to seek alternative and innovation in order to apply the um, translanguaging pedagogy in his classroom in a way that it can generate better uh, learning outcome and in uh, and, and more efficient teaching uh, methodologies. Um, and uh, some examples that he uh, showed me that he, uh, he employed the translanguaging practice in his classroom. Uh, he says like depending on the points of time and limitation of the, of the lesson, he would encourage uh, his students to, uh, to, I mean, to delve into the task-based learning or project-based learning or inquiry-based learning uh, in order to uh, develop uh, his students' employability skill so that uh, his learners' um, uh, linguistic competence and communicative competence uh, should be like something uh, very important for their uh, later phases of life. Uh, so for example, for the test-based learning, he primarily used it in the classroom uh, for the lesson. However, for the project-based learning and inquiring-based learning, he, he, he tend to collaborate with other colleges of different subjects, for example, for the mathematics or physics or chemistry in order to help this, help the students and hope the learners, sorry, and hope their colleges to be familiar with the innovas, innovation uh, instead of like just teaching uh, passively and uh, transmitting uh, knowledge to the student, but engage them into uh, the uh, mini making process and to ask them actively um, participate in the activity that require their determination, uh, require their uh, flexibility, require their uh, like ability to search new knowledge 
uh, from different channels and to ask them to solve the problems uh, that really happened in their real setting. Uh, so that's the better way for them to engage them into uh, using different languages uh, to solve the problem, not just about the property, not just about the, the learned knowledge in the classroom, but use that knowledge in the real setting. I think uh, his belief um, about the benefit of translanguaging is very clear at the end. Um, and the employability, uh, that means about his learners' communication, teamwork, and problem-solving skill and critical thinking skills are the most fundamental um, in his agenda of um, how to teach and how to develop his learners in a better way. So uh, that is uh, what I have learned uh, from the interview with Christian. And um, I am very looking forward to your feedback to enhance my interview. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, comments, suggestions, questions, what do you think about this guy? And uh, actually what he said. Uh, I have one question, Tung. So did uh, Chris uh, read or uh, hear about translanguaging before the interview? Uh, actually, uh, he says like uh, in his teaching credential, that he has got from National University of Singapore and uh, Vietnam National University. He has um, attended some classes of translanguaging. So I believe that he has a very good understanding of translanguaging, but he highlighted that um, like probably there are some like um, differences of uh, learning and teaching culture between Vietnamese and American. So he is kind of like unsure about if, He's doing the right way in Vietnam as opposed to what he has learned from the uh, courses. So uh, that, that is a, the, the problem uh, that I found from the interview, but I'm very sure that he has a very good understanding of how to apply in the, in, in the classroom in particular. Yes, basically the, I asked this question because my impression was that he is quite knowledgeable about the subject. So uh, uh, what you said, uh, shows that basically he uh, knows what uh, translanguaging is and not only knows what translanguaging is but he applies that and at the same time he has his opinion about that so which is positive yeah yeah anything else everybody is tired now yeah because of the uh, presentations, but uh, I still need to ask this question, you know, so because you mentioned right now that he is torn between these kind of two things that on the one hand in uh, Vietnam, of course, you know, there is this kind of desire to focus on the English language and don't use any other language, but uh, in the English class, you use English and focus on English language and culture as much as possible. Uh, but at the same time, he knows the uh, positive sides of translanguaging and he's torn between these two things did he say anything about how he tries to kind of solve this uh, problem okay uh, that's a very good question I think in order to answer that question I just want to uh, like to reflect on his teaching experiences like uh, before he uh, started his job at this high school he didn't realize that uh, the classroom is very diverse because of the learners like uh, focus on the foreign languages so um, I think he he should be aware of um, the uh, some problems about using the trans languaging in the in the classroom in Vietnam because like it's primarily um, like based on the monolinguistic uh, classroom and the students are entitled to uh, follow the test oriented culture but um, his realization uh, shows that like when he started to embed the translanguaging practices in his classroom he 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 discovered that his students are very interested and uh, they have absolutely like they used to have like depression and anxiety to to use english only in the classroom because like he he required them to do so uh, but uh, I think that he 
his belief about like asking the students to support each other and to utilize different foreign, lang foreign languages in the classroom um, would be able to allow them like to feel to, to have more voice of freedom and uh, to, to have more sense of using language and to, to respect the differences and to enrich their uh, cultural understanding. So that's probably uh, what I have learned uh, from, from his uh, experience. Okay, good. Uh, anything else to add to this? To finish with, uh, uh, if there is no, nothing else, um, just to finish with, I wanted 